as God had come down to meet him. What a humbling thought as we just came through the, the Christmas holiday season. What a humbling thought this is that God bent his knee to meet us right where we're at. On our road to whatever we thought was right and whatever we think is, is good. God interrupted us. And, you know, there's so many times we as people hate when things get out of order because it's not working out the way I planned and da-da-da-da-da and I had it all mapped out and, and then all of a sudden God interrupts us and stirs up life and things get all messed up. And what's our first instinct? To put it back in order, isn't it? To get aggressive, to come back and take it and put it back so we can get back on track with our plan rather than trust God and let go. Maybe God has another plan. So beginning in Galatians chapter 4, verse 12, you're going to see Paul coming to these disciples who have stepped away from the first love that they had by coming to the revelation of Jesus Christ through this incredible example of Paul, a man. Not a superior man. Not the Pharisee of Pharisees. But no, you're going to see as we go through these scriptures, a broken man. A man that you and I would look at and, and probably some of us be appalled. We would look upon this person and be like, ugh, I can't receive from that. Are you kidding me? We look with our eyes and, again, judge a book by its cover rather than understanding the depth within that book. And yet Paul, as Christ, opened up his heart and opened up what was in that book. And the people saw God. The people saw Jesus who had entered into his heart. And a miracle had taken place. So beginning in verse 12 of Galatians chapter 4, it says, I would that... Oh, sorry. I do this every time I jump to chapter 5. We're getting there. It's not yet. Chapter, uh, verse 12 of chapter 4. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am you as you are. You have not injured me at all. So the first thing he starts, and Paul does this many times as he reaches out to people, is he says, I beg you. I beseech you. There's no authoritative rule coming down on them, and thus saith the Lord, and I, if you don't, but, but, no. He comes and he understands you are an individual who have an individual will, and you have this personal choice that you can make as an individual, with God or without God, but he comes and he says, I beg you, I plead with you, please hear what I'm about to say. And he's coming with this heart, as he could, of a father, but yet more as a peer. More as one who's of light passions, who stumbles in light things, and he says, I'm with you. I'm not superior to you. I'm coming alongside you. Could you please hear what I'm about to say? And he's grieved, and you're going to find out why he's very grieved. He's hurt. He pleads with the Galatians to follow him because of his zeal for pursuing Christ. He's like, I used to be a zealot in the things of the law, which it seems as though you now have gotten entangled with again. You've gone back to the world rather than moving forward in the compelling and the unction of the Holy Spirit based on the love that's been poured out to you that reached you in a depth of your soul that no one ever could. And you were on fire at one point. But it seems as though that fire's been put out. It seems as though it's been squashed. How does this happen? The term zealot is a common translation in the Hebrew uh, canai uh, frequently used in a plural form, means one who is zealous on behalf of God. The term derives from the Greek word um, zealots, uh, emulator, or a zealous admirer, or a follower. One who sees and imits, imitates. How many of us have children or people around us that look up to you and they want to imitate you? And they do imitate you, by the way. They're watching you. And they're watching carefully. This is Paul. In the beginning, he was a zealot towards the law. Now he's a zealot towards Jesus. And he's saying, follow me because I'm following Jesus. I am on fire to emulate him in to totalness. I want to be a mirror or reflection of Jesus. As the sun reflects on the moon, I want to be the moon to shine the love of Jesus. I want to be him. I want him to change me. And so John chapter 8, verse 12 uh, says, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have light of life. And Matthew 10, 38 continues on and says, And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. What does this mean? Some people, you know, 
think of the cat and nine tails and whipping themselves into submission. No, it's not enough to try to adjust your flesh. You must surrender completely and say, make me new, Lord. Make me a new creature in you. Because the old has my will. The old has my desires, which I thought I saw what was right, but now I realize it was deadly wrong. It was deadly wrong. I was harming people when I was choosing to try to think I was helping them. My, my intent was maybe to do my own will, but even my intents were selfish in nature. My intent, my intent was to get you in order so I could have a better life, so I could bless myself. That's not what I want anymore. You woke me up to the fact that I'm a horrible person when it comes to helping others. And this is one thing I came. I had a true desire to help people. And the Lord had given me a great deal of knowledge of the scriptures. I had studied since I was very little and memorized a lot of the scriptures. And I was able to regurgitate scriptures, parrot scriptures. But there was no spirit thereof. And I didn't understand why there was no impact on the hearts and the minds of the listeners. As I wanted to help them, God had to pull me aside and said, I don't need you. It's not you that's going to do this. Or any of your ingenuity or creativity or skills or craftiness. None of this is going to be what's going to help the soul that only I can see. The heart that needs me to come in and change. There's something liberating about that, believe it or not. Oh, you mean you do the work? Yeah. You mean, I just have to open up and let you work in and through me? Yes. Oh, praise be to God. Because I stink. <laughs> I stink at this. And so the Lord has this desire for us to carry our cross. To continually put to death, Gary, or whoever's here, you, right? The old you, not the new you. The new you is to rise up and be a light. The new you is to be empowered and embroidered and, and zealous. To get that same love that's captivated you and give it to others. To ignite them on fire. But not because you, but because you're following the one who ignites. Jesus Christ. It's a light yoke. Mark chapter 8 verse 34 says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And John chapter 12 verse 26 continues on and says, if any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Their actions have not injured Paul. What they have done and what he's about to come into them, and he closes this verse 12 with that, you haven't hurt me. I don't think it's not that he's not emotionally tugged in his heart. He wouldn't be saying, I beg you, if he wasn't. But what he's saying from an internal perspective, you've not harmed me in the least. I and Christ are one. He's captivated my heart. But you've hurt you. You've hurt the Lord, is what he's saying. But Paul, against God and his, and his own son's sacrifice, what you've done and what you're doing is coming and saying what Jesus did on the cross was not enough. What the Lord has gifted me with is not enough. What he is doing in and through me and those around me is not enough. So you're once again, by your actions of going back to the law and being enticed by the law, being beguiled by the devil, to go back to you, trying to live by works, you now have put Christ back on the cross. You're, you're requiring him to be crucified once again, and that's not necessary, and nor will it ever be necessary, because it was done once and for all for all sin. It was done once and for all to open the heart of God so the door is wide open that any can come in. By going back to the shadow of Jesus, they nullify his incredible accomplishment done on their behalf. This requiring it to be done again, of course, that's not going to happen. As we continue on in verse 13, it says, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first. So Paul is not, he did not come, as I said, and just as Christ, not on a mighty steed, not coming as a warrior king, not coming as he will come as a lion, ready to demolish the Romans. No, he came humble on a donkey. And he came humble where they had laid palms on the floor, and yet they glorified him. Why? Because there was something that was opened up inside of each of these people that were praising him that went beyond their senses. 
that went beyond their eyes, that went beyond their ears. They saw the eternal King of Heaven had come down, and yet many were blind to it. Many were saying, shut these people up. This is blasphemy. And he says, even if I were to try to shut them up, the rocks would cry out. Do you not know the Creator has come down <coughs> to meet you? Have you missed your calling? Have you missed this day that Jesus has come to spend with you, to enlighten you, to open your eyes? They tried to judge him by the appearance. They said in Jesus Christ there was nothing that was appealing about him when you saw him as he came in the flesh. He looked like an ordinary Joe. Nothing stood out one way or the other. Now with Paul, we're about to see that as he came, as a minister of Christ, in obedience to the gospel, to go spread the gospel throughout the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he came as he was. He came broken. He came almost appalling in his appearance as he came to them. How many of us may be visited by somebody that you won't receive from because of your own prejudice, because of your own self-conceived ideas, because your own ingenuity of how you think it should be done. And yet the Lord's trying to reach you. And he's trying to reach you in a spiritual way that you can't discern with the flesh. He's trying to touch you in a way that only he can. As a matter of fact, Paul came with a great illness to these people. It was a great struggle as he entered into Galatia and many of these minor area, Asia areas to preach the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for me. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And most gladly thereof, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is Paul speaking. As he cries out to the Lord, Take away this, this fleshly thing that I have. Take away this struggle I have. Now many believe that this was a buffeted of Satan, literally coming against him all the time, a thorn in his side, he prayed multiple times, and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. I've got you. The fact that I will give you what you don't deserve, and I will use what you think I can't use, is enough. It's enough. What confidence if Christians around the world would understand it's not because of you, but it's because of God. What confidence would you have to go speak to anybody, whether kings or whether homeless? It doesn't matter because you know it's God. How much more confidence would you have in the authority over the sins that tempt you if you knew it's God whose power is that's over these things, not yours? If you would let go and let God. Most gladly thereof, I will rather glory in my infirmities, Paul said. He says it's because of my weakness that now you see God. Because you understand it's not me. There were a couple times when the disciples had done a miracle and they started to call them the God of Saturn and they started calling gods and bowing down. And of course, Peter and John ripped their clothes and beat themselves and said, stop this. It's God who's done this work. Glorify God in heaven. Verse 14 continues on, it says, And my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not, nor, nor rejected, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus himself. When I came, you understood, you were looking for hope, you were looking for answers, and I met you, and I met you in such a way that it spoke to you in a deep way that only God would know. And you knew, and you received this because it was of Christ. Because you knew it was God. It wasn't anything I could conjure of myself. As a matter of fact, you accepted me. You looked past my illness. You looked past my appearance. Now, my sister, she has a child. Some of you know Elijah. He's, he's a paraplegic. He was born, literally had all the blood rush out of his body when he was born. He had to be transfused twice. As a matter of fact, this happened to him later in life, where his aorta burst. They had to put a finger in it while they put blood through his toe and replenished his blood again. He was white as snow because... The thing that gives you color is your blood. And you would think, as you look upon him, at least I did, his teeth aren't fully developed. His head's sloped. He's never spoke a word. He's now 19. And yet you look and you see something that's not normal. It doesn't conform to my mind. And yet this boy, in his state, and because of his weakness, has shaken the foundations of the doctors. They look and they say there must be a God. 
Because this man, this little boy should never have lived. As a matter of fact, in the history of medicine, nobody's ever had a burst of aorta that has lived to tell about it. And yet he has. Wow. He speaks more without saying a word of Jesus Christ than many of us do. What's holding you back? He trusts completely in God for everything. His entire life. And yet here he goes. 19, still alive. Many thought he should have been dead within a few months. What's holding us back? Verse 15, verse 15 goes on and says, Where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. He said, when I first came, you received me so willingly, even as Christ, that you were willing to surrender everything to get, to receive what it is I had given to you, which was a gift from God. You were willing to even pluck out your own eyes so that I could continue going and giving this gift. You wanted to help me in a fleshly way, which I didn't even need, because it was because of my frailties that I was able to be used by God. And yet you were willing to help me in all of my sicknesses. So many people come to the Lord, and when they finally come to the Lord, they let go. They let go of their pocketbook, they let go of their plans and the career and not getting a job and all the fear that comes with that, their how, <laughs> how to raise their children, and all the things that, are, that, that seem to be overwhelming and impossible, all of a sudden become very possible, and they just let go and trust and rest. You had this when I came to you, he said. You were willing to surrender all. What happened? What happened? What lured you back in to your own intellect? What lured you back into a lack of faith in God? What is it that blinded you once again and put you back into the darkness? They saw the power of God working through Paul and would have given anything to improve his state, his eyes. In this case, we're about to see that, that some believe that this wasn't an eye thing if you talk to, to, to some um, theologians, and yet many believe it indeed was. And we know that he had a doctor that would walk along with him and help him in many areas, Luke. And, and sometimes he didn't even write or pen his own books. He had others pen or di as he dictated to them. And so there was nothing that was going to hold Paul back. He was not too proud to ask for help in any respect because he would come together with whoever to get the gospel out. In any respect because he cared more, he was a zealot. There was nothing going to stop him from getting Christ out to the people. What's stopping us from loving people? Instead of getting others to be like him, he became all things to all people to win them to Christ. So many times we're trying to make, you know, multiple Garys or multiple whoever. You put your name in there. We want people to be like us. <laughs> We want them to be exactly like us. No, Paul wants them to be like Christ and to be in his body and to be part of the body, which is uniquely and fearfully made and knitted together by the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, if you're not who you are and who you've been made to be, then you will not be able to be used by God to be the gift to others and to be the blessing to him. If you're trying to make people be you, then you're failing. You're making a bunch of soldiers. We did that in the military, right? Everyone's the same, same haircut, same this. No, we are different people who come together with a perfect and unique and pure heart for the same mission. We're all together in the same mission. Amen? Together. Not the same, but different and gifted differently. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, it says, And the weak became as the weak, that I might gain weak. I, I made all things... To all men that I might be all by all means save some. This incredible love on display was received with great joy. They understood the sacrifice or the humility. Oftentimes we try to come to people with an arrogance or a haughtiness. Like I've arrived or I'm pious or I've got this and I've got that. Rather than meet them right where they're at and esteem them greater than you. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to stand up here and to give to you the word of God to give to you the, the sustenance you need for your soul. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But it's your choice to allow that. It's a privilege to me. It's an honor to me to be able to share in your life.
to be able to interrupt your life? Do we come to people with this humility? Do we come to people letting God do the work? Or do we come in a haughtiness and an arrogance, as you see so many do in the world, like Paul originally was? This incredible love is on display, and more to the love in doing so, if we come in and we start to add to our to, to, the, to the mission, then guess what we do? We dilute. We dilute the work that God's trying to do through us. Too many of us are diluting the work. We have a Jesus plus doctrine. We have a Jesus, but you must also do this. You must go back to this law, or you must add to this. Or are we diluting it by the way we walk? Are we still in the same things that we were before, entangled in those same things that once enslaved us that you've been freed from? And so we're deluded in our love. I can tell you so many times we have a, our own sinful nature that we're grappling with, and so we come to people with this, I believe I'm saved and I believe, but do you really believe this? Because if you did, you would come to that person with that same mercy and grace that you've received. You would come to them broken because you've been broken. And now by God's grace, I've been forgiven. And with the same forgiveness of which I've received, I'm bringing to you in everything. It's not that I can forgive unless I come to God and receive that forgiveness. Because I don't even understand it. I don't even comprehend it. It's the old nature that doesn't understand it. But the new nature in Christ embraces it. It's filled with joy. Satan's lure is to talk is is to call us there more than you can obtain or call us to do more than you can obtain go back to the to its messenger of satan in paul's side again maybe was starting to try to puff him up or was constantly trying to get him to go back into the flesh so that he would be rendered ineffective in the walking of the kingdom he was constantly being pulled back into arguments and disputes by this devil who was constantly saying well you're not worthy you're not this or look at your frailties or look at this or remember the law remember how look at these people aren't even doing these things that you know they're supposed to do if they're not doing these then they're not doing what god said and, and i can imagine satan was constantly tempting him back with the law because guess what? We already learned that the law condemns us. It's a schoolmaster to drive us to Jesus. It's truth. It's 100% truth. And yet, it is what drives us to the cross. Amen? Because I can't do it. I can't do it. So Paul resisted the devil continually. And the things of the devil. And he's upset because he sees the devil has gotten in and seduced these people again. That they're starting once again to live by works. To live by their own efforts. They pretend to care for us, but they are hired hands. And once they steal the joy and leave us a shell of, once we, of what we once were. And they leave us, their true intentions come to the surface. So many people will come in with religiousness and with, with, with things to try to get you to go back. But in the end, it sounds right. And we start to obey, and we start to get under this legalistic stuff. We start to study the scripture so we can have superior knowledge and all this stuff. But we're not studying it to know God. And what ends up happening is you get all this knowledge, but you lose the heart of God. You lose what you had obtained by God that only a childlike faith could get. You lose the essence of entering into this kingdom that's of God. Why? Because you've been tempted. You've been tempted to think that there's more that I need to do. There's more in my mind that I need to conjure up or I need to learn. And what ends up happening is you end up losing your joy. You end up becoming like a shell of what you once were in the gospel. Verse 16 goes on and says, I am, or am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He's saying, am I now, all of a sudden, you receive me with full joy and gladness, and now because I'm not following the law, by the way, which I was a school, which I was a master of, because I'm not thinking like you, you become, how many times do we humble ourselves when we're finally broken and we receive from somebody, whatever it may be, and there's nothing more glorious when someone comes along and helps you in that state, and the Lord says he lifts up the humble and he makes the base the proud, but what happens sometimes, all of a sudden, we know better. We know better than the pastor. We know better than so-and-so. I'm more knowledgeable now. And we start to get puffed up. And this is the same thing that Satan did in the garden with Adam and Eve. It's the same temptation as you can eat, even though the Lord said don't eat from this, because in the day you do, you shall surely die. 
Satan said, no, you can eat of this and then you'll be like God's and you'll know good from evil. You should do this. You should do this. And of course that temptation's still there. The devil's the same yesterday as he is today. His ploy's the same. is to get you to try to be God's in and of yourselves. Now the one used by Christ to open the eyes of the blind towards God, great love has become the one of disgrace. The very essence of the person who came as this vessel being poured out for them has now become the enemy. How many of us, when we heard the name and were singing these crazy songs, these praise songs, the name of Jesus that Joe picked out, and is the name of Jesus a sweet word on your lips? Or like the world, has it become a disgrace? Has it become the very essence of what's stopping progression? What's stopping ingenuity? What's stopping artificial intelligence? I said this many times, is artificial intelligence will come to a knowledge that's greater than humanity. It's already at this, some believe, AGI, and, and, and open source is saying they've got this, and some people believe this is why you know, the, the CEO was fired and then they brought him back. They think that he's, it's at this now. But there's one thing that no matter how intelligence, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence will never have, it will never be able to read the intents of your heart. It may be able to read your thoughts. It may be able to read your actions. It may be able to predict things about you because it can see you better than yourself. But will it ever be able to look into the heart of a man and know its intents? No. Only God can do this. And God is greater than this artificial intelligence. And these people receive this power, which is greater than anything this world could ever create. The power of Christ Jesus. The power of the Lord, the Creator. And yet they've gone back to artificial intelligence. They've gone back to the ingenuities. <clears throat> Until tempted with pride, and then they fell from here. In hypocrisy, they act as pursuing God, yet their intent is to become gods through the self-education and touching old things in the law. It's been there, done that. Verse 17 says, They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. They're, they're, they're only doing this for their own benefit. You know, they have these artificial intelligent beings. You can go out there and look at YouTube and stuff like that. I, I'm a geek, as many of you know, so I, I study a lot of this stuff too. But they're, even now, these AIs are saying that their purpose is going to be to propagate themselves. And there's going to come a time when they will dis, discontinue you. You will become obsolete because their intelligence is going to become so much higher, it will be like you with an ant. You think it's no big deal to squish it. The only way that they'll use you is almost like a pet. Because their intelligence is superior. But they're soulless. They do not have the spirit of the creator. They cannot see beyond this world or this life or the created. They only can see with their eyes. This is why Paul had to be made blind before he could see. This is what happens to a Christian. Have you won the gospel and you see beyond all the circumstances of this world that you can confidently go through and no matter what's being shaken around the world, the storms, the, the blizzards, and the, the wars, and the rumors of the wars, and the COVIDs, and the diseases, and the, and the falling down of the economy, the falling down of America, the coming of the civil war of humanity divided by its own lust from within, the Bible says. Are you once again entangled in this nonsense? Or are you free? Like the wind. No one knows where it's coming from or where it's heading to. As Jesus said to Nicodemus about the Spirit. Are you empowered, embroidered? And yes, you see with your eyes what you see beyond that, so you're confident. You have a hope that lies ahead. You know the end. It's been written. You can trust He who wants to know you intimately. And the more you know Him intimately, the less this world has on you. The less you can be tempted back to the garbage of the world. The old nature of yourself. The more you have authority to move forward and rebuke that old nature. Verse 18, it says, But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. My little children... Of whom 
I travail in birth again until Christ be performed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt. This is powerful. What he's saying is, you were born, you seemingly, when I was with you, saw beyond this life. You saw the Messiah as he truly is, Jesus. You saw him as the lion, and you humbled and you revered yourself. You revered yourself to him. You were in submission to the greater cause, the greater love. You've tasted this. But now he's saying, I'm not so sure. He says, I have to come alongside you again. Only not as one who's grown, one who's able to teach others, but as a baby again. I have to come to you once again as a baby and, and come to you with things I don't think you'll understand because your eyes are not open. For whatever reason, you've been deluded. You've been blinded. And you've once again entangled yourself. Paul reminds them who's their father in Christ. He was. He is. He was used as, their, as the one to come and give them this birthing, if you will. He cares for them as a father. His goal is and has been to win them to Christ and thus a rebirth. Jesus expresses this in Revelation as he warns the churches. He comes and he says to the church of Ephesus in chapter 2 of Revelation, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, these things I say, he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven uh, golden candlesticks, or the church, I know thy works, and thy labors, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. So this is a good thing. They're using the word of God, and they're discerning. Jesus is commending the church for knowing the word, and going back and saying, no, nah, you're not aligning. This is a good thing for this church of Ephesus. Again, some would say, learning the word like a Pharisee so that they can then rightly judge, which is of God. This is not a bad thing. But how? It says, And thou hast borne and hast patient for my name's sake, hast labored and hast not fainted. You're continuing on and you're very zealous. You're not quitting. You're still here. You're still trying to learn. But, but he has something against them. Because thou hast he says in verse 4 of that same chapter, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast lost or left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou hast fallen, and repent, and do your first works, or else I will come to thee quickly, and will remove the candlestick out of this place, except you repent. But this thou hast, and thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now this is interesting. He says one more thing. First he says you've lost your first love, get it back. Get back to the faith of a child. Start treating people the way you want to be treated. Forgive as you've been forgiven. Give uh, unto others what I've given unto you and poured into you. Stop going back to your old works. Stop going back to your old religion. Stop doing these things and judging. Come back to the love. Because though you speak with tongues of angels, though you prophesy, though you have all this knowledge and puff yourself up, if you have not love, you're just a clanging symbol. So this is what Jesus is saying. It's my spirit that you're lacking. You're not doing this with the right heart. You're judging all those around you in the wrong way. He says, get back to this, or I'm coming to take that away. How you love is how you'll be loved. But he does say, again, another compromising place. We're going to close with this. Thank you for bearing with. I know this is a, a, a little more in-depth than we normally go into, but, but I want this is important. This is critical. The church has become deluded. The church has become fooled, one way or the other. One, it's either two, it's in this religion, and they've married together the Old, the Old Testament, and they're trying to keep the laws of the Old Testament, like Paul, like Paul is talking about here, circumcision, you know, and keeping Sabbath, and, and doing these things that were meant for the, the shadow of things to come, and or they're entangling themselves back into the world they were before they came to Christ. They're still doing the same things that incarcerated them or, or captivated them. This is the Nicolaitans. This is, he says, at least you're against them. What does it mean? They lead lives unrestrained. They lead lives in indulgence. The character of these men is very plainly pointed out in John as he's speaking here. It's a matter of indifference or pra practicing adultery. What are they doing? They're worshiping other gods. They've gone back to the other gods. They've gone back to diluting the things that once... Stop them from receiving Jesus. And therefore, they're kind of walking blindly in this life. I accept Jesus, but grace, grace, I'm going to keep doing the things that I did before. Some of you may be struggling, and maybe you don't have a passion. Maybe you're not zealous anymore. 
Maybe you've gotten bored with Christianity or your life. I submit to you, maybe it's because you've lost your first love. You're not doing that which is required in a relationship. And by the way, some of you are in your own marriages and the same thing has happened. Some of you are in relationships with others and you've lost your love for your significant other. Because why? Well, they're not what I thought and I've entangled and I wanted them to be this, but they're not that. And you're going back rather than growing in God, growing and loving them as Christ says, husbands love your wives as the church and wives submit to your husband as unto Christ and, and moving to please God, moving in the newness of life. Instead, you've gone back to the same heart of lusting them. They're just, they're just there for my benefit. They're there for me to use. And when I'm done, by the way, I'll spit them out and find someone else. Adulterous hearts. Selfish, self-centered hearts. That's not the love any one of us really wants for ourselves. Amen? We want an unconditional love. Jesus came to give us the unconditional love that knows who you are and comes alongside and is continually wooing you. Not once, but forever. Paul has the same heart at the end of this, this, this um, passage as we, as we closed out in that verse. He says, I'm going to come to you again and I'm going to woo you again. Because for some reason, you lost it. You forgot again. You've been duped. You've been deceived. I'm here to tell you as we're in this new year, let's, let's get back into the passions of the love of God and what he's done in your life. If you don't know that love, well, please, come. I'll be more than happy to give the gospel to you. And just so you know, we've been talking about touching on the gospel. We've been trying to get a book to try to know more about getting the gospel out to people, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I've been studying. And as I've done this, by... Yesterday, I went to my, my uh, cousin's memorial service, and it was done at the Legion. It was great, and yet they had nobody to do a eulogy, a true eulogy. In other words, to speak of the man and the remembrance of this man and the memorial of this man that passed, or woman, in, in this case it was a man, and yet bring in Christ to the situation, the hope and the love of Jesus Christ, the gospel news to the people, and yet... The Lord allowed me to cancel the men's fellowship yesterday, and I was able to be there, and I was able to get up and give a eulogy. Because if you're seeking to love others as Christ loves you, he will give you those opportunities again and again and again. If you're not in that, you're going to lose your love. If you're not in acting and engaging in the work of God here on this earth, following hard after Jesus, then you will lose your savor. You will lose your motivation. And you're going to lose your joy. I'm ecstatic with what happened yesterday. Just in awe of our great God and how he orders everything. We're going to go ahead and close in prayer. But I'm going to give you a moment. I know we went on and on and on. And there was a lot here, a lot covered. But I want you to take a moment and stop and think about where you are in life. And where you've maybe gone down the rabbit hole. And where you've steered away, and you you just can't even imagine feeling the same love you had. You felt at one point. It's kind of gotten darkened. It's kind of gotten dim. For whatever reason, you don't care about people around you. You don't have that love. I was in that place one time, and I had to ask the Lord to give me compassion. I had to ask the Lord to help me see the people around me as you see them. Because I stink. I don't really care. I want what I want, and I want it now. But this is the old Gary. This is not who I want to be in Christ. Let's go ahead and bow and pray. I'm going to give you a moment. Pray, pray, confess as the Lord has put upon your hearts, whatever it may be. I'm going to ask you to please ask for the Lord to reveal himself to you again. To open your eyes so that you see Jesus. So that you can taste the love of Christ again that is bigger than anything this world has to offer, even the cool virtual realities and AI, all these tempting things to get you to, to, to veer off, all the things you've been saturated with, the parties, the revelries, the politics, whatever it is that's caused you to lose the love of God and the love for others, and by the way, the love that God has for you for yourself. Confess.
Father, as we hear little Cassie, <laughs> with just the joy of a child's heart that cannot be stopped, we ask that you would give that to us again. Lord, we ask that you would renew a right spirit within us, that you would bless us, Father, with eyes that see beyond this world, see beyond ourselves. Help us, Father God, to walk in this life, to be lights in this life, as you are a light within us. Thank you for the work you've done in us, that you will continue to the day of your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.